everyone and welcome back. I'm sorry it's taken me quite a few days to get back to this series, but I hope to have this last and final video in it up before All Hallows Eve or Samhain or whatever you celebrate, if you celebrate anything on October 31st. Today we are covering games and various divinatory activities that are associated with October 31st and November 1st and how they've been celebrated throughout the many, many years. I'm going to go ahead and get started with the Victorians. Much of what we associate with Halloween comes from the Victorian revival of the holiday. Spiritualism, occultism, and the macabre were all very popular in the 1800s. Halloween parties became sort of the rage amongst more affluent families. Seances, fortune telling, palmistry, tea leaf reading, and marriage divination involving apples and nuts, and the telling of ghost stories were all activities popularized for Victorian parties during the Victorian era and shortly thereafter. One example of a Victorian Halloween party comes from the party hosted by Queen Victoria herself. In 1876, the Queen, along with Princess Beatrice and the Marchioness of Ely, celebrated Halloween at Balmoral Castle. It was a grand party, and preparations took place for days in advance. On the night of the celebration, the turnout included farmers and tenants who had come from miles around. The festivities began at nightfall. The November the 6th, 1874 edition of the Stratfordshire Sentinel reports. Her Majesty and the Princess Beatrice, each bearing a large torch, drove out in an open phaeton. A procession, formed of all the tenants and servants on the estates, followed. All carried high torches, lighted. They walked through the grounds and round the castle, and the scene as the procession moved onwards was very weird and striking. The report continues. When the procession arrived in front of the castle, a huge bonfire was lit. It was at this point that the proceedings began to take on a distinctly pagan air. And when the flames were at their brightest, a figure dressed as a hobgoblin appeared on the scene, drawing a car surrounded by a number of fairies carrying long spears, the car containing an effigy of a witch. A circle having been formed by the torchbearers, the presiding elf tossed the figure of the witch into the fire, where it was speedily consumed. This act of cremation over, reels began and were danced with great vigor to the stirring strains of Willie Ross, Her Majesty's Piper. A ball had been intended to follow the celebration. However, owing to the high spirits of the crowd, the proceedings were instead continued outdoors with the bonfire burning well into the night. I apologize for the shaking of my camera. My cats are playing around my feet right now and jumping on each other. So it's very distracting. A popular game during the Victorian era was the Halloween pudding. In this game, the host would bake a fruitcake with five objects hidden inside, a ring, a coin, a thimble, a button, and a key. Late in the evening, the oldest person would silently cut the cake and give out the pieces. The first words spoken after the cake was cut would be prophetic for the year. The person getting the piece with the ring would get married that year. The person receiving the coin would receive wealth. The person receiving the button would meet their love. The person receiving the key would go on a journey, and the person receiving the thimble would be an old maid or a bachelor. Another game involved a single woman going alone into a darkened room with a mirror, a candle, and an apple. 
The aim would be to peel the apple all in one piece while staring into the mirror. It was believed that either her true love's face would appear in the mirror or, if she was going to die that year, a skull would appear instead. In her 1893 book, How to Amuse Yourself and Others, author Linda Beard lists some of the most common Victorian party games that were popular both in England and America. One involves melting lead in order to determine the occupation of one's future husband. Each girl, in turn, holds a door key in one hand, while the other hand she pours the melted lead from an iron spoon or ladle through the handle of the key into a pan of cold water. In the fanciful shapes the lead assumes can be traced resemblances to all sorts of things. Sometimes it is a sword or a gun, which indicates that a soldier will win the fair prize. Again, traces of a ship may be seen. Then the favored one is to be a sailor. A plow suggests a farmer, a book, a professor, or perhaps a minister. And when the lead forms only drops, it seems to mean the gentle inquirer will not marry, or if she does, that her husband will be of no profession. Another game called Three Loogies was popular and derived from the game mentioned in Robert Burns' 1785 poem Halloween, based on the section that reads, In order, on the clean hearth stain, the loogies three are ranged, and every time great care is taken to see them duly changed. The game of three loogies required three bowls, one filled with clear water, one with milky water, and the last one empty. The three bowls are placed on the hearthstone and the young lady who wished to play was blindfolded and led up to them. Beard describes the game as such. She is then told to put her left hand into the bowls. If she dips her fingers in the clear water, she will marry a bachelor. If in the milky water, a widower. And if into the empty bowl, it is a sure sign that she will live in single blessedness all her days. This ceremony must be gone through with three times and the hand be dipped twice in the same bowl in order to make the predictions of any value. There was a version of this game played by Victorian gentlemen as well. It is nearly identical except that according to the 1832 Book of Days, one of the bowls is filled with foul water. If the gentleman dipped his fingers into the clean water, he was destined to marry a maiden. If he dipped his fingers into the foul water, he would likely mar marry a widower. And if he dipped his fingers into the empty bowl, he was fated to end his days as a bachelor. Another popular game mentioned in many books and articles of the Victorian era involved roasting nuts in order to test friendship or compatibility. Two nuts are chosen and placed side by side on the grate or on a shovel that is held over a fire. Beard described the game as follows. If they burn quietly, it is prophetic of a long and happy friendship kept up by both parties. But if in the roasting they burst with a loud report and fly apart, they are decidedly uncongenial and should not seek much intercourse. The movements of the nuts while heating are also closely watched, for the tempers of the persons for whom they are named is said to be thus revealed. A slightly different version of the same game is related in the Book of Days. It states, It is a custom in Ireland, when the young women would know if their lovers are faithful, to put three nuts upon the bars of the grate, naming the nut after their lovers. If a nut cracks or jumps, the lover will prove unfaithful. If it, becomes, um, if it begins to blaze or burn, he has a regard for the person making the trial. Another popular game was the ghostly fire. In this game, salt and alcohol were put into a dish with a few raisins and lit on fire. When the game was at its highest, the party goers linked hands and danced around the table on which the fire burned. Beard described the game as such. The dance was not prolonged, for it was our duty before the fire was spent to snatch from the flames the raisins we had put in the dish. This can be done if one is careful without as much as scorching the fingers, and I never knew of anyone burning themselves while making the attempt. 
other games that were popular at this time of year. In Wales and Swansea, Halloween is also known as Apple and Candle Night, which refers to a traditional game, also known as Spinning the Apple, played each year on October 31st. To play Apple and Candle, a stick with an apple attached to one end and a burning candle attached to the other end is suspended from the ceiling to spin. In order to win, a player must bite into the apple without using their hands and without getting burned by the hot wax of the swinging candle. The Book of Days describes this. The stick being made to twirl rapidly, the merrymakers in succession leap up and snatch at the apple with their teeth, no use of hands being allowed. But it very frequently happens that the candle comes around before they are aware and scorches them in the face or anoints them with grease. Some players even cover their eyes with blindfolds to make the game even more challenging. Others spin the stick around prior to the game to make it more difficult to bite an apple. Apple snapping is an old Halloween game that was once popular in England. It is likely the remnant of an even older divination rite to determine who would be the first to marry. To play, a coin is partially inserted into the side of an apple that is suspended from the ceiling by a string. Players tie or clasp their hands behind their backs and compete two people at a time, to be the first to retrieve the coin from the apple using only their teeth. The one who succeeds wins the game and will be the first to marry. All of these likely come from the same origin place as bobbing for apples. In Scotland, bobbing for apples may be called duking or basically ducking. In Northern England, the game is often called apple ducking or duck apple. In Ireland, mainly County Kerry, it is known as Snap Apple, similar to the game that we already described as being popular in England. And in Newfoundland and Labrador, Snap Apple Night is a synonym for Halloween. The tradition of bobbing for apples may date back to the Roman invasion of Britain, when the conquering army merged their own celebrations with those of the traditional Celtic festivals. The Romans brought with them the apple tree, a representation of their goddess of plenty and orchards, Pomona. However, that claim kind of stands on shaky ground, and some historians question whether such a festival ever actually took place. What can be said with more certainty is that apple bobbing goes back at least a few hundred years, and it does appear to have originated in the British Isles, Ireland and Scotland in particular, and that it originally was a form of divination. British author W.H. Davenport Adams, who saw connections between popular belief in prognostication power of apples and what he called Old Celtic Fairy Lore, described the bobbin game as it existed around the turn of the 20th century in his 1902 book, Curiosities of Superstition. The apples are thrown into a tub of water, and you endeavor to catch one in your mouth as they bob round and round in a provoking fashion. When you have caught one, you peel it carefully and pass the long strip of peel thrice, sunwise, round your head, after which you throw it over your shoulder, and it falls to the ground in the shape of the initial letter of your true love's name. Other versions of the game were also popular, including one where the first person to bite into an apple and get it out of the water would be the next one to be allowed to be married. The custom is mentioned, along with the aforementioned apples suspended on a string, in 18th century Ireland by Charles Valency in his book Collectane de Rubus Hypernicus. A maiden who placed the apple she bobbed for under her pillow was said to dream of her future sweetheart. In Victorian England, the floating apples were named after the young men in attendance, and the contestant furiously gulped at the apple assigned to whichever person she desired to become better acquainted with. According to the superstition, their chances at happiness decreased every time she missed. Let's talk about silent suppers. 
To no one's great surprise, I disagree with a great many of the source documents I read while constructing this series of classes and their perspective or lack thereof on the various origins of the so-called dumb supper. Dumb suppers, meals eaten in complete silence to which the spirits of deceased loved ones are invited, have a murky history and a somewhat unfortunate name. Originally, dumb simply meant mute, but over time it has taken on an ableist connotation that implies a lack of intelligence. I choose to use silent suppers to refer to them instead for this reason. So when I began researching the origin of the silent suppers, I found that I did not agree with many of my contemporaries that their origin is either entirely lost to the sands of time or that silent suppers were entirely and purely Celtic and had their origin only in Samhain. Um, I also found that when witnessing various debates as to the origin of the silent supper, many people did not bother clarifying which kind of silent supper they were saying had roots in this or that. Um, and so I'm just going to go ahead and talk about how there's actually kind of two different forms of silent suppers. So when some people are describing silent suppers, what they're describing is the laying of a table with food for the dead. Um, and basically the idea is that you lay this feast and you set it silently while you eat and there's a place laid for the dead to come and have their share. And some people say that you remain silent so that you can better hear the dead speak to you. And some say you remain silent because they won't come if you are not. There are other ways that this particular version of a silent supper are put on. Um, for example, there, there's one that's popular in Italy in particular where the table is laid with food and then everyone leaves and the room is left silent and the dead are invited to come to the room and to be celebrated with that feast, but the room is silent because no one's in there anymore. A different version of silent suppers uh, that has its origin well, dating all the way back to a particularly favorite Celtic Samhain divinatory treat um, is, is actually a, like a love telling, a fortune telling game to see what your future will be like and who you will marry. Um, and that version is very, very, very popular in um, sort of mountain culture stretching through both the Appalachians and the Ozark Mountains. Um, so I'm just going to talk about sort of the origin of both of these traditions under the term Silent Supper and how they've woven together into the more modern neo-pagan revival of the tradition. I think the origin of Silent Suppers is as blended and syncretized as Halloween itself. I see their origin in the aforementioned Feralia, the Roman holiday that celebrated and venerated the Manes, the Roman spirits of the dead, particularly the souls of deceased individuals. When families would visit the graves of the deceased and bring basically a feast to them and lay the feast out for the dead. There's also the aforementioned practice on Samhain when food would be left out for the dead and or for the hairy ones, and the aforementioned practice that was popular for All Souls Day in the Italian city of Naples during the 14th century with the banquet laid out for the dead while the family went to church. Naples was actually the site of a Greek colony that competed with the Etruscans for the territory from the second millennium BCE onwards. The Greeks also had a celebration that mourned the dead with a feast, the Paradipanon. The Paradipanon was a funeral banquet which took place at the home of the deceased. Cleansing the house was likely a part of the ritual, as were restrictions on the number of people permitted to enter it. From the archaeological finds on top of graves, 
such as ashes, animal bones, and drinking vessels, some part of this celebration likely also took place on the gravesite. It is likely that the food was eventually taken to the gravesite and left as offerings for the dead. But essentially, in both Greek and Roman traditions that would have been in the region where one particular kind of silent supper evolved and eventually became part of Roman Catholic celebrations of All Hallowtide, you can see this idea of laying out feasts for the dead to come and join their families. Now, what we don't know is whether they kept silent for the Paradipanon. We, we don't know that. During the Manx celebration of Hoptuna, divinatory games were very popular, one of which involves something called a sodog valu, or dumb cake, because it was both made and eaten in silence. Young women and girls participating all assisted in baking it, which was done on the red embers of the hearth. First, they helped mix ingredients, flour, eggs, eggshells, soot, and salt, and then they all silently kneaded the dough together. The cake was then divided up and eaten in silence, and then all who had made and eaten it went to bed, still completely silent and walking backwards. The belief was that a divinatory vision would come to participants, often of a future spouse, who would offer the participants a drink of water in their dreams, which after eating that, I'm pretty sure you would need. All of these practices would have developed and merged together during the spread of Catholicism through the Celtic territories. They then came over with the Catholics into the United States, where silent suppers became a popular mountain tradition. In the early to mid-19th century, there was a wave of Catholic immigration to the Americas, primarily from Ireland, Scotland, and England, but also from Italy, Germany, and Eastern Europe. This culminated in a large number of Irish Catholics fleeing from the famous Potato Famine. But even prior to that, there was a great deal of anti-Catholic sentiment throughout Britain in particular. Additionally, most Catholics in Britain were immigrants themselves, and often people of color, so found themselves discriminated against on multiple axes. The promise of opportunity in America was enticing and resulted in the influx of the so-called Catholic hordes. Sorry, that's literally quoting various documents at the time. Um, who found themselves discriminated against in America as well, at times to the point of armed conflict and rioting. Vance Randolph described the American Dumb Supper in his Ozark Magic and Folklore, which gives us a glimpse of some of the real folklore surrounding the tradition as it evolved in the mountainous regions of the Ozark. The following are excerpts from his record of first-person accounts collected in rural Arkansas. In some sections of Arkansas, the girls set a dumb supper by making a pone of cornmeal and salt in complete silence. Each girl must take her turn at stirring the meal. Each must shift the pone as it bakes. Each must place a piece of the bread on her own plate and another on the plate next to hers at the table. When this is done, the girls open the doors and windows, then sit down silently and bow their heads. All during the baking, the wind has grown stronger, and by this time there should be a regular gale blowing through the house. Often the lights are blown out. The phantom husbands are supposed to enter in silence. Each girl is supposed to recognize the man who sits down beside her. If she sees nobody, it means that she will never marry. If she sees a black figure without recognizable features, it means that she will die within a year. Many people still take this business seriously enough to forbid their daughters to trifle with it. Some parents say it ain't Christian and smells of witchcraft, while others object to such foolishness because it sometimes frightens nervous girls into hysteria. An old woman in Washington County, Arkansas, told me that when she was a girl, they always walked backward while cooking and serving a dumb supper and measured everything by thimblefuls instead of by spoonfuls or cupfuls. According to this version of the tale, nobody expects to see an apparition enter the room. No extra plates are set for ghostly visitors and there is no supernatural wind to blow out the lights. Each girl sits down in silence and eats her tiny portion of food, then bows her head over her empty plate. If all goes well, she sees the outline of her 
at her future husband's face in the plate, comparable to the figure seen by crystal gazers and the like. Otto Ernest Rayburn of Eureka Springs, Arkansas, says that in his neighborhood, early May was the only proper season for a dumb supper. Rayburn's informants seem to regard the ritual as more or less of a joke, but the old timers that I have interviewed were very serious about it, even a little frightened. May Stafford Hilburn, apparently referring to region about Jefferson City, Missouri, mentions the dumb supper as an old fashioned custom to hasten the culmination of a budding romance through the mystic rites thus performed. I am not certain just what this means, but Mrs. Hilburn's description calls for midnight, absolute silence, walking backwards, and so on, just like the dumb supper ritual in other sections. In Cedar County, Missouri, the same sort of function was called a dummy supper. Working in absolute silence, walking backward and looking over her left shoulder, each girl placed a chair at the table and set out dishes, knives, and forks as if for a meal, except that the dishes were empty. This done, the girls took their place behind the chairs and stood with bowed heads. The idea was that after a short period of silent concentration, the wraith or spirit of each girl's husband-to-be would appear for a moment in the chair she had prepared for him. One spoken word, a laugh, a smile, or even a frivolous thought on this solemn occasion was supposed to break the charm. There have been cases in which overwrought damsels persuaded themselves that they really saw a ghostly figure seated at the dummy table. One old woman assured me that the phantom husband was visible to all of the girls around the table, but the general opinion is that he appeared only to the damsel who stood directly behind his chair and who was destined to become his wife. Mrs. C. P. Monkey of Mincy, Missouri tells a good story about the dumb supper ceremony. She says that it is not fiction, but a tale that was told and believed in Taney County, Missouri when she was a girl. Here is the story in Mrs. Mankey's own words as published in the White River Leader, Branson, Missouri, January 4th, 1934. A dear friend of mother's, a plump and jolly woman, comforting and reposeful, not one capable of harboring such strange and weird beliefs, told the story of the dumb supper so vividly, so impressively, that I never forgot. She and mother were quilting, and as the story progressed, she would bend her face to bite off the thread. She got in the way of giving a cautious glance over her shoulder, and before the tale had ended, I too was giving rather odd glances out into the long, darksome hall. She was talking as if she had been present, or as if she had been intimately known, the parties engaged in the supernatural feast. It seemed the family were away for the night, and the grown girls, left in charge of the home, had invited in some neighbor girls to keep them company, so a dumb supper was proposed. This meant that in utter silence, and every step taken to be made backwards, the table was to be laid for a guest who would come in at midnight, and who was to be the future husband of the girl at whose plate he sat down. The table was only set for one, as it seemed at the test only one girl was brave enough to thus put her fortunes on trial. The others watched her in fascinated silence as she stepped quickly, if awkwardly, about her task in the big, low-ceilinged kitchen. She placed a peculiar knife at the side of the mysterious guest's plate with a roguish smile at her friends, a sharp-bladed knife set into a piece of deer horn for the handle. In utter silence they waited until the old clock slowly droned out the twelve strokes of midnight, when, to their terror, the door was dashed open, a tall form advanced, with swift, noiseless steps, and then an icy wind blew out the light, and one of the horrified girls screamed, but one braver than the rest closed the door and lighted the lamp. No spectral visitor, they were alone, but the maiden who had set the table pointed with white face and shaking hands, the peculiar old knife was not there. Later, this girl did marry a stranger who had come as a visiting cousin to the home of a nearby neighbor. And they seemed to be very happy, although the man was very quiet, even taciturn. One day, the girl's mother, going across the ridge to visit her, found the little cabin strangely cold and forbidding and hurried in to find her daughter lying as if dead with the knife thrust into her breast. When at last help had been summoned, and the old backwoods doctor, able surgeon was he too, brought her back to consciousness, shudderingly she told the story. In a moment of girlish confidence, she had told the story of the dumb supper and the strange guest, as tall as you, she had said, and he had listened in sinister silence. Then he went to an old leather valise he had always kept locked, 
unlocked it, took something in his hand and said to her coldly, and you are the one, you are that witch. That night I walked through hell and thrust the knife into her breast and ran from the house. He was never seen again, and the knife was the same old peculiar knife with the deer horn handle and the keen blade that the thoughtless girl had laid when so careless and gay she had set the dumb supper. During my time in the pagan and neo-pagan and occult and esoteric and spiritual community, I've attended both kinds of what was called well, they called it a dumb supper, I prefer to use the silent supper. I have attended the kind where a feast was laid for the dead and a plate was put out for the person that you wanted to have visit you and you had to stay entirely silent and they would come to the table and eat with you. And I've attended the kind that was a divinatory ritual as well. Um, I don't think when we're having these debates as to the origin, it's right to say that only one kind is valid. Um, right. Berin briac is a quick bread with added dried fruits. In Irish, the word berin means loaf and the word briac means speckled. Hence, it literally means a speckled loaf or similar etymology to the Welsh barren brief, as in a loaf of bread speckled with fruit. In modern times, the dried fruit is often sultanas or raisins, but grapes did not grow in Ireland during the time of the Celtic celebration of Samhain, and raisins or sultanas would have been very, very, very expensive. The bread is associated with the modern celebration of Samhain or Halloween in Ireland, as both part of the feast and as part of a divinatory game played during Samhain and Halloween. An item, often a ring, is placed inside the bread and the person who receives the piece of bread with the item in it is said to have good fortune coming to them in the following year. Some versions of the game, which may be older than the modern versions, which often involve a ring, um, have various objects baked into the bread, a pea, a stick, a piece of cloth, a small coin, originally a silver sixpence, and a ring. Each individual item, when received in the slice given to a person, carried divinatory meaning for the person concerned. If a person received the pea, the person would not marry that year. If a person received the stick, the person would have an unhappy marriage or continually be in disputes. If the person received the cloth or rag, the person would have bad luck or be poor. If a person received the coin, the person would enjoy good fortune or be rich. And if a person received the ring, the person would be wed within the year or have happiness in their current marriage. Another article added into the Baron Briac in particularly Catholic regions included a medallion, usually of the Virgin Mary, to symbolize going into the clergy, although this tradition is not widely continued to this present day. Commercially produced Baron Briac sold at grocery stores for Halloween still include a toy ring. Baron Briac was traditionally made in flattened loaves, although modern recipes are often made in bread loaf pans, and they weren't particularly sweet. It was more like a regular bread than a cake. Um, the butter it was served with, as butter was a major part of Samhain celebrations, might have been sweetened with honey. I'm hoping to actually get to make this. Uh, for our All Hallowtide celebrations this year. Um, I did get in all the ingredients, either that or soul cakes, and I I really haven't decided. I might make both, yeah. Um, so, as you can see, divination and divinatory games and fortune-telling with food were incredibly popular for many, many, many hundreds of years as part of Samhain and All Hallowtide celebrations, um, first over in the British Isles and then coming over into America. So if you do choose to incorporate that into your celebration this year, um, let me know and let me know what you did. Like, what did you make? How did you play? I'm really excited to hear. Thank you all for joining us for this series and sticking with us to the end. If you're hearing me talking, I assume you did. Um, I just want to say that the notes that I worked off of for this particular class were turned into a 
118 page booklet that is available in both PDF and print form. Um, all of our patrons were sent the PDF and it actually contains various traditional cooking recipes for things that we've mentioned through the series like soul cakes, um, like Baron Briac, um, and various other things like uh, butter and slider. Um, and that we also have the booklet created. Um, and you can see it has various songs that were sung by the mummers and the geysers, and it has various recipes on how to make certain treats. And I know I'm kind of promoting this very late since All Hallow Tide is just a day away, but um, it will end up going up on our website probably after uh, All Hallow Tide and be available there if you want to purchase it for next year's celebration. I'll try and have um, the booklets ready a little sooner in the future. And um, anyway, Thank you all for joining us, and uh, you can find the link to our Patreon beneath the video if you do decide that you want to become a patron and receive notes on classes like this one and on our other topics. And um, please remember to like and subscribe, and if you like this series, let me know, and I will do the exact same thing for the next major set of holidays which I think would either be late harvest or the combination of Christmas time, um, Yule, solstice, and various other winter holidays. And I'll sort of go into all the history and traditions thereof. Be safe out there, everyone, and whatever you celebrate this October, I hope that you have a wonderful one.